I'm excited. How many of y'all want God to keep y'all? See, if we, if we can be kept by God, then when trials and tribulation come, it don't blow us down because we're being kept by something higher than the wind that's coming. Truly, I am first giving honor to God who's ahead of my life, to the pastor of this great church, to the ministers on the roster, to the MIAs and the Women's Missionary, happy anniversary. Amen. I count it not robbery that you have given me an opportunity to speak, and I thank God for it, and I pray God has a word for his people. If we can turn to Matthew 5. And I'm going to be reading from the message version of, of this. Matthew 5, 13. Through 16. And it says, let me tell you why you are here. You are here to be salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors of the earth. If you lose your saltiness, how would people taste godliness? You've lost your usefulness and will end up in the garbage. Here's another way to put it. You're here to be light, bringing out God colors in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. If, you make, if I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. Now that I put you on there on a hilltop, on a light stand, shine. shine. Keep open house. Mm. Be generous with your lives. Yeah. Be, by opening up to others. And you will prompt people to open up with God. Yeah. This generous Father in heaven. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for another opportunity to speak, God. I ask you that it allow me to decrease and you increase in me, God. And I pray that your word will go forth clear and unhindered, Father God, and that we can be better men and women for you. Oh, God, we trust you and we love you. Amen. Amen. If I had to pen a text... Text will be very simple. Mm -hmm. On a mission. Mm -hmm. Pass the salt right. and shine your light. All right. On a mission. Pass the salt and shine your light. All right, now. I know we always sing the song, let your light shine, shine, shine. It may be something in the valley, somebody in the valley trying to get home. Y'all know that song, right? And we always say, let our little light shine. Uh -huh. But I never really ever seen a little light. Because right. even when you plug in a light to your night light, after a while you can see that light illuminate that whole wall. Right. So I want to dig up the myth that we don't have little lights. Right. We got big lights. Yeah. Because if we're going to sit up on the top of a hill, we can't have a little light. Right. Because if we have a little light, they won't see us. But because we're going to sit on top of the hill and we have a bit light, when they see us coming through, it should be catching to everybody who's coming like, uh-oh, here they come because our light is so bright. So what is that saying? And I'm, I'm, I'm going somewhere with this. If our light is bright, when darkness see us, they ought not want to stay dark because guess what? That's uncomfortable to them. Okay, let me, let me make it home. Let me make it bring it to you. You, you know when we were living in a world of sin, uh -huh. and we did things that we should not do, right. nine times out of ten, we did it at what? Night. 
at nighttime. Why we did it at nighttime? Because we didn't want folk to see her do it. Well, maybe y'all not. Y'all probably not. I did. I just say me because y'all might not with there. But okay, so I didn't want people to see me do it. So I did it when nobody could see me do it. And I snuck around so nobody could see me. What am I trying to say? If we're connected to Christ, people shouldn't be comfortable doing anything and everything in front of us. According to Matthew 5, 13... After Jesus finished giving the beer to the disciples on the mount, he told them two purposes in the world. See, Matthew was teaching something to the disciples. Jesus had matriculated from being, um, he, was, he was born of Mary. Then after he was born, he had to flee death from King Herod because he was looking for him. Then he had been baptized by John the Baptist who prepared the way for him. And then he was being tempted by Satan. Y'all know that story. To, to, to even after he was tempted by Satan, after the temptation and he got over the temptation, he began his ministry in Galilee. Um, after he finished with Galilee and began his ministry, he seen two people out there fishing named Peter and Andrew. That was, and then he said, y'all come follow me. I'll make you fishermen of men. This is all what happened before we got to the Beatitudes or where it talks about blessed. And so when, after Jesus said that, he said, the disciples and they followed him. He came to him. He said, now after you follow me, Jesus started teaching them something. And he taught them the Beatitudes. And the Beatitudes is, um, talks about being blessed. And the translation for blessed is Greek words that translate to spirit, spirit well-being and prosperity. And after telling them what it takes to obtain it, he went on to tell them about, about what they are and what are they required to do as believers. Matthew 5.13 starts off in the Message Bible reading. Let me tell you why you are here. This phase, well, when I read this, I read it actually when I was at Cody Grove. And I was there at VBS. It was Tuesday night, I think. Yeah, it was Tuesday night. And, and, and Amita went said that, let me tell you why you're here. It spoke volumes to me. Because I researched the definition of the mission. And I looked at the mission. And a short version of mission said to sin. But there was another long educated version. You know folks like to get deep. And it said a divine activity of sinning intermediaries where the supernatural are human to speak or do God's will so that purposes for judgment or redemptions are further. Now, one word I didn't know what it meant, so I went and looked it up. And it said intermediaries. And then when I looked up the word intermediaries, it said the middleman. And y'all know how y'all try to tell people, you know, cut me out. Just go straight to them. Don't tell them middleman. But let me tell y'all something, missionaries. Y'all are nothing but the middleman. Okay? And not just missionary. If you say you the middleman. We can't cut the middleman out. Yeah. Because we in between near and God. So yeah. guess what? If we don't give the word to them and we cut the middleman out. Yeah. Right. So as I looked up the definition of the middleman. Because I didn't quite understand it. I went on and it went to the natural world. And it was like a middleman is like a play. But say you had a company. The middleman was the seller. Like Dollar General. They the middleman. All right. They ain't making the products. They selling the products. Uh, they, 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 but, but here's the thing. The middleman is very important. Because if Dollar General doesn't have any, I mean, if Dollar General is sitting over there with no products to put in it, and, and it's not there, even though I'm making the products up here at the corporate office, but there's no Dollar General for me to sell the profits, guess what? The profits just stay over there. But because of the middleman, the products can be sold. All so right. guess what? Because of you, people can know who God is. Because every time. So we can't eliminate the middleman. So I said all that to say MIA, senior missionaries and the people of God. Matthew 5, 13, this is message says again, let me tell you who you are. See, you can call yourself the middle man. It's okay. Uh -huh. Or the middle, middle woman, perhaps. Or even the facilitator. Uh -huh. Or make it biblically sound. You can bring, call what Jesus said. You are here to bring out the God flavors of the earth. Uh -huh. So I'm the salt. All right. 
Or you can say what Jesus says, you are here to be light, bring out the God colors in the world, so you are the light. Our role as believers are to congregate and to spread. it. The whole purpose of our being is to spread the gospel. But to understand salt signs and importance of salt in the Old Testament and the New Testament, I look to see what they use for salt. Not only season, not only did they use salt for seasoned food in the Bible, for meat offerings and season. So anytime they went to sacrifice something, they put salt in it because salt persevered it. And, 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 and not only did they do that, in some cases down in, I think it was in Leviticus that I read, that when they did the salt, they would rub the babies in the salt after they were born. They wouldn't even cut the biblical cord because the salt persevered. Yeah. We, pers- oh my God. we preserve what's here. If the, we leave here, it's messed up. I ain't trying to be bold or nothing, but they need us. Because as long as the salt here, we're preserving the earth. Let Jesus take us up out of here. Salt, Jesus used to describe how Christians need to bring, need it, or needed to bring home balance and hope to the otherwise dying world. But guess what? If salt is what's needed to bring balance to the world, why are we responding like the world when situations happen? Because guess what? If you need me in the world and I help bring balance to the world, why do I have to act like the world? To me, me, it it confuses me because when Jesus said this, he said, salt preserves and enhances We are preserved for the world just as Jesus is preserved for us. Jesus preserved for us. We're preserved for the world. Y'all, John 17, 15 said Jesus pleaded with God to preserve us. He said, I pray not that you should take them out of the world, but you should keep them from evil. Now, let me tell you what evil is. He said, no, you may have trials and tribulations, but he going to keep you from the deadly sins. Guess what? Jesus is going to preserve your children. Jesus is going to preserve your household. Jesus is going to preserve your family. When we live as a salt and or an enhancer to the sensitive world, we are preserving it from being totally destroyed and feeling the wrath of God. The wrath of God is for those who rejected Jesus. You don't have to finish experience the wrath. Because when Jesus come back, we're going with him. The wrath ain't going to happen and I'm going to be still on earth. The wrath going to happen and I'm going to be caught up somewhere to be with Jesus. So you don't have to walk around and fear, oh, Jesus come back. Yeah, he coming back. But when he come back, I'm going with him. You better make sure you're going. Preserving the world of the wrath is being held back because of us. So since we are the salt and the light, we have to do what it takes to add flavor and enhance the dying world. Well, oh, okay, well, I'm salt. Now, 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 one thing I know about cooking, and I might get this wrong, because I don't cook much. But y'all pray with me. But one thing I know about cooking those seasoned cookers like me, cookers like me, Drew, you can ask her how much she put in something, and she probably going to be like, oh, I just put a little pinch of salt here and a little pinch of salt there. But me, I got my little measuring spoon trying to make sure I put the right amount of salt because I don't know how to cook like that. You know what I'm saying? I do all right, and we survive, but it ain't nothing like. <laughs> See, but, 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 but one thing that salt does no matter how much you put it in there, or no matter how much you do, it enhances. No matter what you do, and for God, it's going to enhance it. I may put too much salt over here, but you may put just enough, but we both going to enhance the kingdom. I thought about this thing, and I said, well, tell them, how do you enhance and be a beacon light. You remember I told you, we ain't a small light. We're a big light. All right. But how do I enhance and be a beacon light 
to the dying world that seem like they won't listen. Wow. I'm glad you asked, Reverend Lasby. If I may call to the witness stand a man called Noah. (laughs) Noah was a man who loved God. Therefore, he was obedient to God. Obedience helped you be a beacon light. (laughs) Noah felt the stress at what the people were doing. It sounds like the day when everything going on, we're a little bit distressed. Don't be real with yourself. When that stuff happened, it tore me. It, it did something to me. I was a little bit distressed because of the sins of the world. But in, in, in Noah, in, in the midst of all, because he was the only righteous man that they could find. He spent all his money and time and energy to build this ark. Now, when I heard about this ark on Tuesday, it blessed me so much because the ark was so big and he asked Noah to build it. He didn't say, Noah, I'm going to give you a team. I said, Noah, I need you to build it. Right. Now, 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 now this, this is what helped me to understand something. Because if we're going to be the salt, we can't look at the size of the mountain that we're trying to accomplish. We can't look at the person and say they've been through so much stuff. But we got to do just like Noah do. Just start building. Just start getting a little salt on it. See, it wasn't easy to build, but it was possible because not only Noah was obedient, but he was connected to God. Let me tell you something, when you're connected to God, it ain't no devil in hell can stop you from doing what God has called you to do. Yeah, they may talk about you and yeah, they may scandalize your name, but do you know who my daddy is? That reassures me that we do all things through the Christ that strengthened us. We want to overcome racism barrier between the black men and our children and the police officers and our teachers. I'm going to be real. We got to do it through him. We want for God to heal the sensitive land. We must do it through him. We must know what he said and what as African Americans stand on it. He said, what, what, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and seek God's face and turn from their wicked ways. I will heal their land and forgive their sins. You want McDuffie County healed? Turn from your wicked ways. You want people set free from poverty? Turn from your wicked ways. Stop talking about them and start praying for them. Noah built while they talk. Y'all got to go while they talk about it. You can't worry about what they say. Just go anyway. You can't worry about everybody saying, well, they didn't go. That's all right, but I'm going anyway. You can't worry about what Pastor told us to go here three times. I don't care what he said, but I'm going anyway because I'm building while they talking. And then Noah built while they told and, and, and they laughed at him, but one thing that Noah had to have to build a big ship like that, Noah had to have faith. He had to have faith in God that while they were making mockery of him and ruled Mars, he had to have faith that even though it looked stupid to the natural man, it was what God had called me to do. Not only he had to have faith nor to allow himself to be the salt and the light that caused men to see the difference in him. He didn't act like they did. He didn't respond like they did. He didn't retaliate like they did. He just kept doing the will of God. Now this was hard for me this week because I wanted to say a whole lot of stuff to some folk. I wanted to call some folks and tell them some stuff. But then when I looked at Noah and I seen Noah, but they said this to Noah. And not one time did Noah say anything back. He just kept doing the will of God. We don't have to fight with the people. We just need to do what God has called us to do. No. He remained humble. He remained kind. He remained gentle. He stood up for his principles. Noah was a righteous man. I'm telling you how to keep your soul in your life. He was blameless among the people. He walked with God. 
And if we're going to be an effective middleman right. for God, it, would hurt, it wouldn't hurt to look at the character of Noah and take heed. People who want to be light and to be salt in the world can't get weary in well-doing because you will reap if you faint not. You have to trust his word. When, when he tells you you are the head and not the tail, above and not beneath, you got to trust what God says. You can't look at what it looks like because what it looks like is temporal. But in the end, it's eternal. You have to walk with God daily. You have to remain humble. You have to let your light shine so that men can see your good work and glorify the Father which is in heaven. You have to stand up and stand on the principles of God. You have to be kind and you have to be gentle. You have to be understanding and you have to be patient. And not only that, you got to make your life blameless. So it won't taunt the image and the idea of who the God you serve. See, because I, I t- I'm telling you something about people. Even if you're trying to get it right, if it look wrong, they're going to automatically connect you to your dad. They said, but she was here, or he said he was this. But look at what he's doing. We have to walk circumspectly so we won't taunt the image of our God. You got to love all people. That's what Noah did. He didn't hate them. Regardless of who they are and what their mistakes are and where they come from, you got to love them. God wants his people to pass the salt and let your light shine. Philippians 2, 14 through 16 said this, and I'm reading from the message. He said, do everything readily and cheerfully. Not bickering, not second guessing, no second guessing allowed. Go out into the world uncorrupted. A breath of fresh air in this squalid and polluted society. Provide people with a glimpse of a good living and the living of God. Carry the light giving message into the night so that I have good cause to be proud of you on the day that Christ return. You will be the living proof that I didn't go to all this work. I didn't go through all this work for nothing. Now, what am I trying to say? Sometimes you must be honest. And, and, and as I thought about this, because if you go back to where Jesus said this, he said, if you lose your saltiness, how will people taste godliness? You've lost your usefulness and will end up in the garbage. Now, those 15, um, um, Matthew 5, 13b, if you lose your saltiness, Another version said, what good is salt when it's lost? It's favor. What Jesus knew was trials were going to come. And it can cause us to become weary if we're not careful. And just like salt begins to be diluted and altered by water. Y'all, y'all think about this. You, you ever made some grits before? Well, I have, y'all. But, but in the grits, I done put so much salt in them grits, you can't hardly eat them. So to cover the salt, I keep on what? Water. What am I trying to do? I'm trying to dilute that salt a little bit. Well, it, the, the water, water altered the salt. When we put too much salt in it, when, when I think about when you put too much salt in it and it have to add more water, Christians can be diluted by experience. All right. All right. All right. Now, let me tell you how Christians can be diluted by experience. What, what we believe before a traumatic event is sometimes not the same afterwards. Trials can make us become weary. Weary, you know how it is when you're feeling a showing tiredness. What does it mean to grow weary? The Greek word talks about to labor until you're worn out. Right. You're depleted. You're exhausted. You feel with toil, a burden, a grief. God, as he was dealing, he even showed me Christy, you have become a little weary. And what he showed me, there's some weary folk, not just here, but it's some weary folk in Mount Pleasant today, not just on the MRA or the mission, but some of us have quit because we're weary. There are some weary folks in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. There are some weary people in Minnesota. There are some weary people in Dallas. 
There are some weird people all over this world. In churches and in government, these people are depleted and worn out. But now I'm talking about not just anybody. I'm talking about some Christians now. Now, because so much has happened. But let me tell you, God told me to tell us this. There's a spirit of weariness that's trying to take over. The spirit of weariness also can be known as spiritual dryness. Spiritual dryness. When you're spiritually dry, how do you know you're spiritually dry? You're giving while you're empty or weary. We're no longer giving to others of a sense of fullness. We're, you're doing it just because I'm just giving. Two, you're serving out of duty. When you're spiritually dry, there's a something shift in your motivation to serve. Whether it's in the church or elsewhere, no longer motivated by passion, or you feel inner inter reluctance, you're doing it just because I got to do it. But because I am a Sunday school teacher, I come to Sunday school because I got to do it. Right. I'm weary. We serve maybe because others are relying on us or we want to honor our commitment with God. Right. But or even just to feel a duty towards God right. and towards his calling upon our lives. Faith, another thing, if you know you're spiritually dry, your faith is no longer contagious. Yeah. Psalms 51, 12, 13 says, David asked for a renewed joy. He had not lost his salvation as a result of his sin, but he had lost the joy of it. He wanted God to clear away his sorrows as well as his sin. He wanted to be a happy man again. David wanted pardon and renewed sanctification. See, David understood that there is healing in his God for sinners such as him as well as pardon. When we are spiritually dry, it affects our relationship with those who know, don't know Jesus. Yeah. People can't see us, something that's something that causes us, it hinders people from seeing us, that because when they look at us, they see a lack of motivation. Yeah. I, I, I've been guilty of this, nobody tell you, what you got to do? Yeah, I got to get up and go to Bible study. I mean, uh, lack of motivation, I'm doing it out of obligation. Uh -huh. I become a little weary, I become spiritually dry. David wanted a restored joy. Now, he wanted to experience again the joy of rescue from the power of the great enemy. He wanted to experience again the joy of power. Another thing, if you know you're spiritually dry, God feels distant from you. When you are spiritually dry, there can be a gradual, di gradual distance from God. Either we have a hard time getting in contact with him, Every, either we, we, we praying and we just don't hear, we just feel like, God, you hear me saying this over and over again, oh, oh, but you in a dry place. Spiritual dryness. It leads your life in a rut. You lack the excitement you want. Say, you know, when we first got saved, we were just on fire. Every time the door swing open, we were there first sitting on the front pew. But after a while, we get in this little rut. And because we in this little rut, uh -huh. our devotional time stop. Uh -huh. Or I slack up just a little bit. Uh -huh. we, even st we start doing something just out of rope, memory, exercise. We just do it because I get up at 3 o'clock in the morning and study. So I'm just going to keep getting up at 3 o'clock in the morning and study. Uh -huh. Ain't no passion and I'm just doing it out of routine. Guess what? I'm going through a rut. Uh -huh. We love God, but we lost the sense of being in love with him. Our relationship with God has lost its freshness. Another thing that hinders our spirit I'm almost done. It's contributing events. Spiritual burdens. Tragedies. Sudden trauma. It can deplete us spiritually. That's why we need some salt. Because some folks been depleted and they ain't never regained it. Because they've been hurt so long and they've been enduring this thing for so long. So they're spiritually depleted. Well, guess what? They're in a dry place. Yeah. Well, if they're in a dry place, something about salt, it can bring moisture too. You need spiritual dryness will cause you to have negative thinking. You got to answer for everything. You got a reason why you can't do everything. You got a problem with everything that needs to be done. 
you got to make an excuse because pastor said be here at 7 o'clock and why can't we be here at 8 o'clock because it works better for somebody else. We, we, just, we just in a dry place. No matter how, no matter how pastor said, it just don't make sense. That's negative thinking. Oh, you know, we all been there before. But I want to encourage you not to be weary in well-doing. You will reap if you faint not. So even when you find yourself in a spiritual drought or a weary place, Ask God to reveal to you, what is it? What is, it? Yeah. is it a confessed sin? Uh-huh. Is it me just being lazy? Yeah. Do I have a bad attitude about yeah. stuff? Am I being self-centered? Uh-huh. And I'm focusing more on me than I'm focusing on you? God, what is it that get me in a dry place? Uh-huh. Yeah. But, but let me tell you something about our God. He loves us enough uh-huh. that even in our dry place... When we done did the wrong thing, he still loves us enough. He's saying, come on back, baby. I've been waiting on you. Where you been? Yeah. That's right. Romans 10, 17 states, consequently, faith comes by hearing the message. And the message is heard through the word of God. Yeah. If you want to get out of your dry place, uh. you got to start studying that word. Yeah. You got to start getting into the word and allowing the word to speak to you. You got to be coming in settings where it's teaching you stuff so that you can get out of your dry place. Yeah. See, the word reveals our sin. The word get, gets us back in focus. It is the word that removes us from complacency. It is the word that provides reassurance. Yeah. And it is the word that tells us to be rest. Because Jesus tells us, he said, come unto me, all ye are heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest. Yeah. See, spiritual dryness, you can't rest when you dry. Yeah. That's right. That's right. My Lord. God is still God that sits on the throne. Earth is his footstool. See, God, the God, you see, we got to understand about the God. God still needs us to be salt and light of the world. And he still can use us where we are, even if we made mistakes. So let me tell you something, you salt people and light people. Continue to be like God. We serve. Remain steadfast. Unmovable. Always abounding in the Lord. Because your labor will never be in vain. Jesus' labor was not in vain. Because of his labor and his love, he went to the cross for us so that we can have life and have it more abundantly. Jesus knew that Sunday was going to come. When he got on that cross, he knew Sunday had to come. You need to understand in your trials and tribulations, Sunday's going to come. When Sunday comes, resurrection comes. When Sunday comes, deliverance comes. When Sunday comes, healing comes. When Sunday comes, I'll be able to shout my troubles over. When Sunday comes, I can lay down my burdens and stop carrying them around. Because Sunday is coming. Because through the snow they slay me, yet will I trust God. Because as long as I'm breathing, I'm going to be okay being the middle man. Call me what you want. I'll be the middle man. Because the middle man got to help God. We're going to be his advocates. We're going to be his voice. We're going to help people get called to Christ. So call me the middle man. Because I'm glad that I'm the middle man. Because Jesus went to the cross on the Friday. So I can be the man. He got up Sunday. So I can be the middle man. But when he got up Sunday. He had all power.
My scar said he was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for my iniquities. And by his stripes, I'm healed. Hey, wait, no, I'm healed. He died so that we can have everlasting life. Jesus became the middleman for us, took upon us our own punishment. His sins, he, he, he put on his shoulder, and he died on Friday, but early on Sunday morning. Because God was pleased with the middleman. God was satisfied with the middleman. He raised him from the grave early on Sunday morning. And because of that, we now have the right to everlasting life. And today, if you have not been in touch with the middleman, if you don't know the middleman has died for your sins, I I ask that you 